Well, welcome, saints of the Lord, and tonight I'm going to be preaching on the armor of God, part two. Last week I spoke about um, being strong in the Lord in part one, and being strong in the Lord and the power of His might, and understanding that we are in a battle, understanding that we are soldiers in the army of God, and tonight we're going to cover the actual armor. And in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 verse 20, through verse 20, I'm going to be reading that. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, take on the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Hallelujah. Now, I covered the first three verses in part one uh, last Wednesday night. You can go check that out um, on our archive sermons. So I'm going to really kind of jump into verse 14. But, I, but verse 13 says, therefore, and, and the question is, what's it there for? Because it tells us that, listen, our, our war is with spiritual principalities and powers. It's, it's with Satan and his little henchmen. It's not with people. Now, we know that the enemy can use people. Listen, he's used, I'm sure, us uh, many times. But we are fighting this spiritual battle, and we need spiritual armor. And so Paul is going to use analogies here from, from weaponry, of natural weaponry, but he's going to use it as an analogy or a metaphor for spiritual armor. So in verse 14, it starts with, Stand therefore. And the word stand there in the Greek means to abide. Very interesting word. It means to abide, to continue in covenant, to set, to set oneself to hold your ground. We need to hold our ground, church. Listen, we, the only territory the enemy can take is what we allow him to take. Is what we do when we don't stand in the authority that Jesus Christ has given us. We have the whole, the power, the anointing, and the indwelling of the Holy God, the Holy Spirit, dwelling inside these vessels. Man, we are powerhouses. Hallelujah. Listen, we are no match for Satan without Christ. But in Christ, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And see, Satan's no match for God. Amen. So, so without Christ, Man, we're at the mercy, but in Christ, come on, church, hello, he's at the mercy of God. So he says, stand therefore, abide, continue in covenant, set yourself to hold your ground, and you have and, and girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. So we see a couple parts of the armor here, right? So having girded your loins with the belt of truth. Now, when you think about girding the loins or protecting the loins, it's really the place of procreation or reproduction. So we need, we need to think about that because we are supposed to be reproducing. You listen, you'll reproduce what you are. So, man, if you're a holy man or woman of God or teenager or youth or young adult, whatever it may be, man, you are a powerhouse for God and you should be reproducing what you are and who you are in Christ. So we need to stand, have that, the ability, the protection that as we move in the things of God that the enemy is trying to hamper. Listen, it's not just you he's after. He's after what God is doing in the kingdom by using you as one of his soldiers. Hallelujah. You are important and precious to God. And so in John 17, 17, it says, 
Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So we see here that the, the word of God is truth. Jesus Christ is truth. And it says we are sanctified by the truth. The truth being Jesus Christ and the truth of his word that we actually become sanctified to God. Now in John 8, and I know this would be a verse that many of you sure know, John 8, 31 and 32, many people quote verse 32, but they don't quote, quote verse 31. And verse 31 is critical with verse 32 because verse 31 is the condition to be met for the promise that is in verse 32. And we're going to see this. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide, and we just talked about that word abide, continue in covenant, that we make a stand, hold your ground, set yourself. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. So we see the condition there for being a disciple is that you're somebody that abides, that you continue, that you press in, that you hold your ground, that you continue in covenant. You set yourself to, to continue to hold the ground that God has given to us and if you do that in his word, abiding in the word, then you are my disciples indeed. Then, verse 32, and you, that word and is a continuation, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Hallelujah. Listen, it's one thing to hear truth. It's another thing to receive truth. And it's another thing to apply truth. So we know the truth of God's word, that we are more than conquerors in Jesus Christ. But do we apply that truth? Do we, do, do we make it applicable when we're being attacked? Do we apply the truth that I'm more than a conqueror? That the truth of the word of God that sanctifies me, that, that no weapon formed against me will prosper. Do we apply that verse? Do we believe that verse? Have we received that verse to the point that we are willing to apply it in faith through the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit? Man, I hope somebody's getting this tonight, man. This, this should be, your socks should be curling up in your shoes if you're wearing any. Man, I, I'm just so excited about what the Word of God has promised to us and that we just need to stand in this weaponry that God has given us. Now, an interesting thing about the belt for a soldier. If you know anything about armor, if you research anything, the first thing they would put on was this belt. And this belt was where all the other armor attached to this belt. So they could move around and, you know, wouldn't go flinging and flying around. And everything got stabilized by the belt. Every, all the, the, the breastplate, the, the, the leg irons, everything got attached to this belt. The, you know, his sword, his weapon tree, all got attached to this belt. So they just weren't flinging around wildly, but they had access to grab their daggers, you know, the different weaponry that they would use depending on the battle that they were in. So when, when he put on this armor, he would attach all these other parts. So it really became, they, they call it the belt of foundation. And as I was researching this, and, and it's the belt of stability. And, and it leads to agility. See, stability will lead to agility in battle. That means, man, you're quick, man. You could swoop around, you can move, you can dance, you can, listen, part of our, our weaponry, our warfare is dancing in the Lord, amen? Praising God, singing, worshiping God. But it's all attached to this foundation of the belt of truth. So, and, and you, listen, you have to know the word. It says, know the truth. If you abide in his word, you will know the truth. And the truth will make you free. And then we know another scripture says, and whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Hallelujah. So truth becomes the foundation for, for us as believers. And listen, what do we see in the world today? We see a lack of truth. We see people don't want to understand, they don't want to look at facts. There's a lot of things being said, but they're not factual. And when you bring a fact, they've actually made comments like, my, my feelings are more important than your facts. Well, listen, if you throw facts out the window, man, you're going to be all over the place. Like James says, you'll be, you know, like in a wave, tossed to and fro, with every wave of wind of doctrine that comes along and, and whatever people want to say. But we always go back to truth. Remember when Pilate was dealing with, with, with Jesus, a lot of people say Jesus was before Pilate. No, Pilate was before Jesus. He's God. Amen. Jesus is God. Hallelujah. So Pilate was actually before him, and he said, what is truth? You know, I, I, it's like Jesus was like, you're looking at it. Amen? He didn't actually say that, but he, he was implying that. 
And so we see the truth about God's word. And then the second thing is, see, knowing the truth of God's word is one thing. The second thing is, we got to know the truth about myself. And, and listen, the worst deception is self-deception. And, and not accepting where I really am. Not accepting, you know, saying, man, you know, I, I'm a weak in that area and I need help. I need to pray. I need to, you know, uh, solicit people to pray for me. I need to get into the Word of God. If there's an area that I find myself in worry or doubt or discouragement, listen, that, that doesn't mean you're not a believer. It means that we got to sharpen up. we got to get into the Word, right, and sharpen up and receive the truths of these words. That if God be for you, who can be against you? I mean, we we got to receive that word into our spirits as life. Amen. We, we, ha- we must have our minds and hearts renewed in Christ and completely transformed. Romans 12, 2, right? And, and, and be, have your mind renewed. By the renewing of the mind, we are transformed into Christ. Amen? And it says, be not conformed to the world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Church, we, we, don't be, we don't get conformed to this world. We don't jump on the bandwagons of every crazy thing that comes down the pike or, or it sounds good. No, we filter everything through the belt of truth. That brings our stability, that brings our agility in, in, our, in our warfare here as a believer in Christ. And so the truth will transform our mind. Listen, we, we come to the Lord, and there's a lot of baggage. You know, remember the story of Lazarus, and he was dead, and they said, Jesus, if you had been here, he wouldn't have died. And then Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. You know, do you believe this? And they said, yes, Lord, we know. And then Jesus called Lazarus out of the tomb, out of the grave. And it's sort of like we were all dead. We were dead in our trespasses, Ephesians says. We were dead in our trespasses. Then Christ came along, set us free, called us out of the grave. But you remember when Lazarus came out, he was still wrapped up in the grave clothes. And when we come to Christ, we're still wrapped up in some things sometimes. Amen? And and we need to be set free of those things. And how do we do that? It's through the truth of God's Word. If God's Word says it, I'm standing on it. Amen? Amen? And i got to remind myself over and over and over again because sometimes I get weak or I forget or I get caught up and and I allow my mind to dialogue with the devil, right? And I preach the message on that, no dialogue. You can go back and check that out on Wednesday night a few weeks ago. No dialogue with the devil. I'm trying to equip the church and the saints on these Wednesday night teachings. The second part of the armor we saw in this verse of Scripture was the, the breastplate of righteousness. And think about what does the breastplate cover? It, it covers the internal organs. It, it, it covers the place of the heart. It covers the life organs that flow. And, and if you know, like, uh, uh, police officers or, or military personnel, they'll wear it with these bulletproof vests. And they're trying to protect, so, and if they're a SWAT team or something, they'll wear a helmet to pr- protect the vital organs from, from being, you know, shot or, or some kind of blunt force trauma. So the, the, the place of blood flow, think about this. Spiritually, the place of blood flow, the rib cage, right, protects um, against blunt force, but it doesn't protect against hurtful words. It doesn't, the rib cage cannot protect you from mental and spiritual attacks against your mind, against your spirit. When you're a young child and you're being told, you know, you'll never be anything or, or some trauma had happened to you in your life growing up or, or some kind of guilt, some kind of shame, you know, something maybe we chose to do or maybe it wasn't our choice and something someone did to us and, and we carry that and, and, and the rib cage and the flesh is not able to protect you from that. But Jesus Christ is this breastplate of righteousness, this spiritual armor that we place, standing in truth. So someone says to you, you're no good, you can say, hey man, I'm a child of the King. I'm a child of God. Hey man, hey man my worth is in Him. God doesn't make any mistakes. He only makes perfection. God doesn't make throwaways. He only makes keepers. Come on, church. Man, you you got to fill up with the Word of God. you got, you got to combat lies of the enemy with, with the truth and that breastplate of righteousness. Amen? For, for we need spiritual weapons. And righteousness is something we are in Christ. What is that righteous breastplate? That's who we are in Christ Jesus. 
We have the Holy Spirit that is inside of us protecting these vital organs, man. And, and, and in Christ, we bear the fruit of this righteousness in our life. Let's look at 1 John 2.28. And this week coming up, I'm going to be doing some devotions um, out of 1 John, the book of 1 John. And man, strong stuff. You want to you get challenged. Read the books of 1, 2, and 3 John, and it will challenge you in your faith. But 1 John chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. And now, little children, and there's this word again, abide. Abide. we got to stay abiding in Christ. Abide in Him, that when He appears, you may have confidence and not be ashamed before Him at His coming. If you know that He is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of Him. That's why we, be, we are saints. When we get born again and saved, we, our life should be earmarked by righteousness, not sinfulness. You know, some of these preachers out there and these teachings out there that, you know, you're still going to sin all the time and all this. No, you, you don't have to sin. The Bible doesn't say when you sin. It says if you sin, you have an advocate, 1 John 1, 9. And, and so it says we need to practice. Those who are believers, we should not be practicing sin. We should be practicing righteousness. Hallelujah. And then 1 John uh, Chapter 3, verses 7, says, Little children, let no one deceive you. Listen, listen, listen to the Word of God. This is truth. We're sanctified by truth. The belt of truth. Everything's starting with the foundation of truth. Little children, do, do let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. And I didn't give them this, but in verse 8 it says, and he who sins is of the devil. I challenge you, read chapter 3. It's part of my devotions this coming week. And it, it, will, it will change your way of thinking. So, so we need to practice righteousness and not practice lawlessness. Let's go to the third part of the armor. And that, it says here in verse, uh, I think it's, let's go back to Ephesians 6. And we're going to go to verse 15. And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Hallelujah. The word shod here means to be tied to the gospel of peace. We need to be entwined. It's a word for entwined. If you take, you ever see a three-corded rope? And they're really strong. They take three strands and they just kind of wrap them. Sometimes girls get their hair what they call braided. And, and it just it makes it really strong. And so the word means to be tied to, to be entwined to the gospel of peace. Make your, listen, make your, sure you're fully prepared and sure-footed and you won't slip or fall and you'll be unmovable in the ways of God. Having your feet entwined, having be bound to, right, the, the, the gospel. And, and here's an interesting thing again. The, the Roman soldiers, and, and listen, Paul was using this because of these analogies, and they would understand this. Roman soldiers had cleats in the bottom of their shoes, shoes or, or sandals, I guess you'd probably be a better term, so they would not slip or fall or be pushed around in battle. Did you hear what I said? They had these cleats at the bottom of their shoes. Remember the, the soil and the terrain that, uh, that they would you know, be in, the topography of that time, very sandy, uh, very uh, rocky. Um, they were on the hills, you know, all kinds of battles. And if you've ever seen any of maybe the movies, you know, the Ten Commandments or maybe some of the old gladiator movies, where, where they would line up with these big shields and they would, you know, march up and they would plant. And so the other armies would come or people, they couldn't push them. And it's sort of like a, today we have baseball cleats or football cleats, soccer cleats. It makes them sure-footed, these athletes sure-footed, so, so that, that these Roman soldiers wouldn't slip or fall in battle. They wouldn't be pushed around in battle. And the, and the scripture here says, in possessing the gospel, it, it's like cleating your footing. It gives you a firm footing. It gives you the ability not to be pushed around in battle. Listen, the gospel of peace of Christ brings a calm over our hearts, our mind, and our souls, standing in the peace of God, and not we won't be moved because we are in harmony, we are in union, we are in spiritual alignment with God 
and his word, hallelujah, the God of peace. And if you look in Psalms 16, 8, look at this verse. It says, I have set, I have set, planted firmly the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand and I shall not be moved. Hallelujah. Listen, this isn't in our strength. It's in the Lord's strength, but we have to armor up. we got to put on the whole armor of God. And as I said last week, too many Christians are putting on some of the armor, part of the armor, but they're not putting on the full armor. We need to be fully armored up. And there's another verse, church, that I, I love this verse. It's actually one of my uh, favorite memory verses in Isaiah 26, verses 3. And it says, you will keep him, that person, in perfect peace. This is a promise, but now let's read the condition. So the promise is, you will keep them in perfect peace. Praise God. Amen. But listen to this. Whose mind is stayed. The word stayed there means fixed. Firmly fixed on. Clamped onto. Because he trusts in you. So God says he's going to keep us in perfect peace because our minds will be fixed on God because we trust in God. That's why our minds are fixed on God, because we trust in God. And listen, even in the midst of a battle, we can have the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, the book of Colossians says. The peace of God, he says, let the peace of God reign and rule in our hearts. We have to allow that peace, invite that peace, stand in that peace by standing in truth. So let's get to the fourth part of the armor, and that is the shield of faith. The picture here is that I said these Romans would carry these, they were called door-shaped uh, shields into battle. If you've ever seen pictures of them, but these, these shields were probably four or five feet in, in, in you know, height. And then they were you know, maybe two feet wide at least, maybe a little longer. And they were fixed so they would all get and, and march behind these, they had a helmet on, and they would have that shield and they had a little cutout where they could look through that shield, and they would line up t together, you know, arm, like shoulder to shoulder, and they would go across, and it would, it would build a wall that, that no one could penetrate. You, you'll see uh, police officers using this, or military, sometimes when they have to go into sit situations, uh, crowd control, different things like that, you'll see them employ this kind of a weaponry. Uh, really, it's more defensive, but it can be used as an offense. So they would get behind what they call a door-shaped, shield. Church, and this is what the Bible tells us, to put up a shield of faith. Could you imagine when the church stands together and we stand shoulder to shoulder and we pray, man, that we build a wall. And I love the scripture, it says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, I think it's Isaiah 59, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of God will raise up a wall against the enemy. Man, are you getting that picture? And if we stand as believers, man, in faith, we are creating a shield. And, and what does it say that this shield will do? Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 16. Above all, listen, above all, this is important. Taking the shield of faith, which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Hallelujah. Man, when you're behind, when those guys were behind those shields, they would shoot these flaming arrows at them, you know, spears chucking at them, all kinds of things, that rocks with slingshots, and they would launch these things, but they would hit these shields, and, and they would not affect the one who was behind the shield. The shield would absorb the attacks of the enemy, these fiery darts, it says here, and we'll be able to quench, that means, quench means to put down the fiery flaming arrows of the enemy. Come on, church. And listen, they trusted these shields. They would go into battle. They had to trust that shield, or why would they stand behind it? They would, they would break ranks if they didn't trust that that shield was going to stop what was being fired against them. And we as Christians have to understand that when we stand in faith, it becomes a shield to us. And when we stand together, oh my gosh, it's like an impenetrable uh, a wall that, that God constructs. Amen? And so... If, if we're not in faith, church, think about this. If we're not in faith, what are we in? <laughs> we're in the flesh. And if we're in the flesh, we're open. We're, we're prey to the enemy, P-R-E-Y. When we don't stand in God's truth, armored up, 
what our, our the, the, the belt of truth, the bless, breastplate of righteousness, say that 20 times fast, and then girded our, our waist right, right with truth, and then having our feet shod with the preparation uh, of the gospel of peace, and then we have the shield of faith, which is able to quench all the fiery darts of the enemy. When we are in the flesh, your feelings get hurt. When you're in the flesh, it's real easy for your pride to get in the way. It's easy to get wounded, right? Sh should I continue on? When we're not in faith, we become uh, easily offended. We're not in faith, our pride. When we're not in faith, we can easily move into the flesh. Listen, let me, I'll just prove that. You ever been in a traffic jam and you didn't have your armor on? Come on. I'm guilty. I admit it. One of the things that I need to get patience in is traffic. I can't stand traffic jams. We were talking about that earlier before we prayed this morning. But, but praise God. I think you got the point. Having that shield of faith standing in the belt. See, the, the, the truth is anchored. So the shield or the breastplate of righteousness, they're all attached to this belt of truth. Amen. Let's go to the fifth part of the armor, and that's the helmet of salvation. And that is verse 17. Take the helmet of salvation and the word of the Spirit, which is the word of God. It's interesting that the sword comes after all the other weaponry because this is a, both a defensive and an offensive weapon. The word of God, the living scriptures, amen, that, that we can use to protect ourselves, but also... This can be used as a weapon. Some, some believers have gone out and used the scriptures as a weapon to, to tear down people, to be you know, legalistic and, and just, man, smash people instead of coming. At, see, the Bible says to, to speak the truth, but it adds in love. We are to speak the truth in love. So I'm, I'm glad that God doesn't tell us about the sword first. He tells us about having the belt of truth. He wants you, before he wants you to weld that sword, he wants you to stand in truth. And part of the truth is, is that we come in truth in love. And that is the balance, man. If you don't have love, you don't have anything. That's what the Scripture talks about to us, right? So we, this helmet of salvation protects the brain. It protects the mind. It protects the, the, the thoughts, the emotion, the temptations. And, and I wrote this quote, right thoughts win battles. Come on. Right thoughts win battles. That's why we come to Christ. That's why we come into church and hear the Word of God. we got to get rid of our stinking thinking and stand in the right thinking of God because right thinking wins battles. If we're in the flesh and we're thinking wrong, man, we're going to get chewed up. We're going to get into the flesh. We're going to create all kinds of problems, and we're going to strike back. We're going to try to get even when the Bible says, vengeance is mine, say the Lord. And the Bible says a kind word turns away wrath. That when somebody tries to revile against us, even Jesus didn't revile back. He spoke words of love. And I've been there where people are getting testy and angry. You go into a store or whatever, and somebody's all fired up, having a bad day. And I noticed that when I come with kindness, the majority of the time, those people will calm down, even sometimes apologize. But, but man, when you, when you give it back, it just incites more and more, and, it just get, and before you know it, it's out of hand. I think you know what I'm talking about. And you lose your peace. You lose your peace. You're not standing in peace anymore. When you get into the flesh, you're going to lose your peace every time. But standing in the love of God. And love always looks for the best in others. I want to read an illustration. It's a true story, and it was from the Korean War. And it says, and this is about right thinking. It's a right about an attitude. Is the glass half full or half empty? But, but if we had this mindset as believers, listen to this. During the Korean War, the Baker Company got separated from its unit. Finally, a radio signal was picked up. Baker Company, what is your situation? The radio man for Baker Company responds back, the enemy has us surrounded. They are on our north, they are on our south, they are on our east, and they are on our west. We are completely surrounded. The radio man, after a short pause, there was no reply from the other end. And then the radio man from Baker Company added this, I don't believe the enemy will be able to escape us this time. <laughs> Church, victory is a mindset. It's in Christ, but we got to have the mind of Christ. Right thinking wins battles. And I'm talking, we're talking spiritual now, right? But even in the natural, 
If you've got some general that goes off you know, crazy and not thinking and not uh, through using his training and, and, and using his mind and, and thoughts, and hopefully they're seeking the Lord, right? They can, they can get you killed. But if you've got somebody that's trusting in the, the training and, and, and everything's kicking in and they've got right thinking, they're, they're not losing it, they're not in panic, they're calm, they're thinking right. As believers, we need to stay. How do we stay calm? We already talked about it. When we trust God, when our minds are fixed on Him, He will keep, it at, keep us at perfect peace. Amen? Because we're not trusting in our ability. I'm trusting in the ability of the one who has called, saved, anointed, and set me free. Just the same one that did it for you. Amen? Hallelujah. Praise God. Let's go to the, the sixth uh, part of the battle. You know, also, I want to make one more comment about that helmet of salvation. We have to realize what salvation really means. What it really means. What, what we really got in salvation. It wasn't just um, delivered from the power of sin and Satan. It, man, it's so much more. It's being engrafted in. We're being, uh, you know, taken out of some things, but we're being placed into some things. Into Christ. The Holy Spirit's placed into us. And man, read all the promises of God that when we come to Jesus Christ. Amen. Sixth part is the sword of the Spirit. And so that's going to be in verse um, uh, 17 as well. Take on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It's interesting, again, that the sword comes later, and, and it can be both an offensive weapon, and it says, by living the Scriptures, you protect yourself. Psalms 119, verse 11. Listen to this verse that David wrote. He says, that I may hide the word of God in my heart, that I might not sin against you. Then when we treasure the word of God and we have that word of God in our hearts, man, it will, it will keep us. Because remember, it's sanctified by the word, the truth of God's word. And when you apply the word, you can defeat the enemy. Remember what Jesus did in Luke chapter 4, verses 4. When the enemy came in, Jesus defeated him with the word of God, the word of truth. Jesus answered, remember Satan came to tempt him, and Jesus answered, said, it is written. It is written. It's in the word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceed out of the mouth of God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now I want to get to the final part, the seventh part of the armor, and that church, and a lot of people don't include this as part of the weaponry. But it says praying, verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Prayer is a powerful weapon. Man, prayer is more powerful than an atomic bomb in the spiritual sense. Man, prayer changes things. Prayer gets the attention of God. Amen. And, and listen, again, this can be an offensive and a defensive weapon. Let's look at Luke 22, 26. Listen to this verse of Scripture, Luke chapter 22, 26. But not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. So we see that, that this, this weapon, I think that I gave the um, wrong Scripture reference there. That's not the one I was actually looking for. It was one about prayer. But let's go back to Ephesians 6, 18. Hallelujah. And it says, praying always with all prayer. Listen, church, we're to always to be praying because it's a powerful weapon. Prayer is our connection with God. It's, it's, it's our intimacy with God. It, it connects us with God. And it says, in prayer, through the Holy Spirit, we're watchful to the end with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. Man, we're making intercession for one another. And then Paul even solicits prayer for himself he says and for me that utterance may be given to me that i may open my mouth boldly and make known the mystery of the gospel paul says pray for me for boldness that that man i'll be bold in the time that i'll need it to be bold and i'll proclaim the mystery of the gospel to the lost for when i'm an ambassador in chains that in it i may speak boldly as i ought to speak remember paul's writing this from prison and, and paul Paul, very possible he was chained to a prison. A lot of times they would chain prisoners to them. It's possible he was chained to these soldiers while he was writing the, this, these, this, this scriptures of Ephesians to the church. 
saying, man, listen, I'm, give me boldness that I can speak. Pray for that I stay in, bold as I'm an ambassador in chains, but that I may continue to speak boldly. Hallelujah. The Word of God. And church, I want to I say a couple things here. Remember, this is something God dropped in my spirit. Remember, we're not fighting for victory. We're fighting, fighting from victory. Oh man, you got to get that. It's a big difference fighting for victory versus fighting from victory. We already have the victory. Jesus Christ already defeated Satan and the devil and all his power. we got to stand in our victory. So we're fighting. Listen, we read. I read the end of the book. I know who wins. So we're not fighting for the victory. That's already been secured in Christ. We're fighting from a stance of victory. Hallelujah. Isaiah 59 is going to be my last verse uh, tonight. Isaiah 59, verses 14 through 18. It says, justice is turned away backward. Now I want you to think about what's going on in our society right now. Justice is turned away backward. And righteousness, uprightness and right standing with God stands afar off. Listen, for truth has fallen in the street. The city's forum and uprightness cannot enter the courts of justice. What this scripture is saying is that everything's turned backwards. You know, just they're, they're calling evil good and good evil. We're, we're living this. Right, everything's turned upside down. Righteousness is, is afar off. Truth is fallen in the street. The, the city's forum, the, words, the world's forum, that I, un, uprightness can't even enter into the courts of justice. Man, we are seeing this. Yes, listen to what it says in 15. Truth is lacking. We are lacking truth in a society. And he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Do you know what that scripture saying? He who stands for truth becomes an enemy. That people want to go after and look at their tearing down stuff and tearing up stuff. Anybody that wants to try to speak truth or facts, man, they, are, they become prey. They become a point of attack. And listen though, and the Lord saw it. The Lord's seeing it. And, he, and it displeased him that there was no justice. What we're seeing a lot is lawlessness abounding. And the Bible predicts that. And the Lord looked and it displeased him that there was no justice. And he saw there was no man. This is heartbreaking. He saw there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. No one on, to intervene on behalf of truth and right. Therefore his own arm brought him victory and his own righteousness, having the spirit without measure, sustained him. Oh, hallelujah. For the Lord put on, listen to this church, this is amazing. The Lord put on righteousness as a breastplate or a coat of mail and salvation as a helmet upon his head. He put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and he was clad with zeal and furious with a divine jealousy as a cloak. Now, I, I, want, I, want, you to, I want you to get a hold of this and listen to verse 18. According as their deeds deserve, he will repay wrath to his adversaries recompense to his enemies on the foreign islands and coastlands he will make compensation there's coming a day jesus is going to come back he's going to write all this stuff but man does that not describe what we're going through today but i want to say this to you this is amazing to me when i read the scripture because in the old testament the lord himself wore the armor but in the new testament he shares that armor with us he shares that armor with his church, his beloved, his saints, his children. And that's us. We are sharing in the weaponry of our Lord. Let's pray. Father God, I just pray for anyone out there man, being attacked in the mind. Lord, I pray that we will put on the whole armor of God and, and therefore we'll be able to stand uh, with the, 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 the belt of truth. Hallelujah putting on that whole armor and putting on the, the breastplate of righteousness, our feet shod with the preparation of peace, taking up the shield of faith to quench all the fiery darts, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, and the weapon of prayer. And Lord, I pray for each one today. There be an attack that, Lord, they will stand in the authority that you have given us. I pray for breakthrough in every life 
I pray breakthrough in those marriages, breakthrough in those households, breakthrough in the situations that are going on. I pray that church will be raised up in intercessory prayer to pray for all that's going on in our society, that the church would lead the way in praying for justice to prevail, that God, you would raise up voices of truth and voices that are anointed with authority to prophesy and to speak the word of God boldly, as Paul said, and declared, hallelujah. But we know, Father, in the end times that you're going to stand, you're going to come, and you're going to write all these things. But in the meantime, Lord, let us stand in truth in the weaponry of our Lord. I pray blessing to each and every one who logged on tonight and that is, is, is watching this broadcast. May they be encouraged, may they be lifted up, and may they stand in the power and the authority of Jesus Christ our Lord. And everyone said, amen. Hallelujah. God bless you, church. Hope to see you on Sunday.